Hello, everyone, and welcome to this teleconference hosted by NS Focus, the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation. I'm your host, Casey Minnis, Director of Communications for MS Focus, and I'm joined today by Brian Hutchinson, who will be talking to us about exercise for people with MS. Brian Hutchinson is Director of the Multiple Sclerosis Achievement Center in Sacramento, California. The center provides wellness programs for people living with MS, including physical, cognitive, and emotional wellness. As director, Brian oversees the program development, staffing, and administration. Prior to this position, Brian also served as the CEO of the Huga Center for Multiple Sclerosis, which is now called Can Do MS, and as a physical therapist at the Rocky Mountain Multiple Sclerosis Center in Englewood, Colorado. Brian's volunteer service has included serving as the president of the Board of the Governors for the Consortium of MS Centers and on the National Multiple Sclerosis Society's Clinical Advisory Committee. Brian is a licensed physical therapist in California and holds a specialty certification as an MS certified specialist. We're pleased to have him join us to present this important topic. Brian, thank you for being with us, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Casey. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to uh, everyone today about exercise. Um, we know that uh, uh, we're facing more challenges and with the inability to get out of the house and um, participate in, in maybe activities that we normally do uh, at the gym or, or otherwise. So uh, hopefully we can provide some practical uh, approaches and some practical solutions uh, on ways in which you can exercise, not just during this time of quarantine, but also uh, beyond. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, um, we see here on the, on the slide, if you have access to it, that uh, we've broken down rehabilitation, physical activity, and exercise. And, and for those who don't have access to the slides, uh, essentially what we identify uh, are some of the, the similarities as well as some of the differences. But, but rehabilitation really is defined um, by care that can get you back uh, and help you keep or improve abilities that you need for daily life. So it's very functionally oriented. Uh, something that we identify uh, with being able to improve in areas of, of uh, activities of daily living. Physical activity um, is really any bodily movement. So anything that we do that requires some sort of energy expenditure. Uh, so uh, when we uh, are doing different activities um, uh, uh, during the day, uh, we are moving our bodies and we're expending energy, and, and that is physical activity. Uh, exercise, on the other hand, is really uh, a category or a subcategory under physical activity uh, because it is a planned and structured uh, repetitive type of um, uh, program uh, that usually has a specific objective uh, around physical fitness, improving flexibility or improving strength. Uh, perhaps uh, it is losing weight. Perhaps it is uh, improving blood lipid levels. All of those kinds of things related to physical fitness are typically uh, the uh, objectives of a structured type of exercise program. Uh, so the, the other component I think that is important to note is that when we talk about a rehabilitation program, uh, physical activity and exercise are often focal components of that. We think about it, uh, and mostly from a physical therapy standpoint, uh, many rehab programs are, are wide-ranging that include uh, other uh, disciplines like occupational therapy or a speech-language uh, pathologist uh, to look at cognitive function as well as uh, speech and swallowing. Uh, the occupational therapist may be looking at uh, other kinds of uh, activities of daily living how do we get dressed, how do we uh, do grooming, uh, all of those kinds of things. And, and exercise may certainly be a part of uh, how you accomplish those activities or how, those um, goals also. Uh, so rehabilitation really often includes uh, an exercise program. 
So the next slide, as we move forward, uh, kind of takes us down a little bit of a path of memory lane. Um, and and I, uh, when we get to the end of this, uh, we'll try to look at some things that, uh, that are interesting about uh, how exercise programs have evolved. So uh, the, the, this slide indicates popular exercise programs of the 1950s. And uh, really, this was just done by a Google search, so um, it doesn't have a lot of scientific uh, basis uh, behind it. But these were some of the things that popped up as popular exercise programs in the 1950s. Uh, and the first one was jumping jacks. And, and we all can kind of harken back to the days of, of physical education when we were doing um, jumping jacks. And, and uh, that was part of our uh, activity program. And, and in some ways, uh, some of these things were actually tested as part of the President's Council on Physical Fitness and, and the like. Um, the, other, uh, the next bullet indicates calisthenics and, and resistance training. Um, and uh, indicate uh, things like Jack LaLanne um, and some of the uh, different programs that he offered around calisthenics and, and resistance training. And, and if you recall, um, for those who, who remember, um, there uh, wasn't a whole lot of equipment involved in, in those types of uh, activities. Um, these were things that could be done at home uh, that utilized household objects or body weight and, and those kinds of things. And then there was another program called the five basic exercises, which included touching your toes, uh, abdominal crunches, push-ups, stationary run, and leg kicks. So those are the five exercises that were included, and you went through a cycle of those. Uh, this program was designed to be completed in 11 minutes uh, and was developed by a, a Canadian Air Force veteran. Um, so they really tried to look at kind of a whole body workout in which you would be doing some flexibility, some strengthening, uh, a little bit of uh, aerobic or endurance type of activity, uh, and, and even some balance in there. Um, so these were popular exercise programs in, in the 1950s. If we move to the next slide, um, we fast forward uh, 40 years and, and uh, some of the popular exercise programs according to Google uh, of the 1990s uh, were step aerobics. Um, so, uh, you know, Jane Fonda was, was very popular with some of her programs uh, at that point in time, and uh, step aerobics was, was one of those things that was really taking off. Uh, Taibo, uh, kind of a combination of martial arts and kickboxing uh, as an exercise program. And, and a lot of these were videos and, and um, uh, things that were available for people to do in their home. Uh, other gyms would uh, often incorporate these uh, activities also, like step aerobics and even Taibo, uh, but they were often made uh, to be available at home uh, through a tape or a DVD or, or the like. Uh, Buns of Steel was another popular exercise program, um, and uh, this, this was really a, uh, what is described on Google as a Pilates-style exercise, uh, and these were really um, looking at lower extremity strength. Uh, and then uh, spinning uh, became a little bit more popular and, and in some cases uh, continues to be popular, uh, which was stationary cycling um, to music led by an instructor. So uh, these were specialized bikes that uh, allowed people to um, participate in a stationary cycling program, uh, and the music uh, helped facilitate that process uh, as well as an instructor um, that led the program. And then as we move forward, we look at uh, the popular exercise programs cited for 2020. Uh, the first one on the list is high-intensity in, high interval training, <clears throat> excuse me, which uh, really includes short bursts of high-intensity intensity exercise uh, with periods of rest or, or, um, or lower-intensity exercise. So these are kind of circuit-type training uh, activities in which you do short bouts uh, of high intensity exercise. This is something that has been very pop very much popularized uh, in um, exercise circles today. Uh, ways of looking at trying to uh, gain many of the benefits in a shorter period of time. <clears throat> CrossFit is another one um, that is identified as a um, popular exercise program of 2020, uh, which is a type of high intensity interval training uh, which utilizes functional movements. 
Uh, these tend to be specialized in uh, specific gyms, and uh, there have been some criticisms about uh, uh, CrossFit as well as other programs uh, in, in terms of uh, injuries and, and the like. So uh, these are things that need to be approached uh, in, with some caution. Uh, TRX is another um, type of uh, popular exercise program. Uh, these are the use of um, body weight uh, for the development of strength, flexibility, balance, uh, and these are using a, a very specific suspension trainer. Uh, P90X is a, a at-home DVD program which includes exercise as well as nutrition. Uh, and then Peloton is another very popular uh, type of exercise program which, uh, again, is stationary cycling uh, but using technology uh, in which you can participate with people from across the world and uh, the instructor uh, is on your TV set on your uh, stationary cycle. Okay, so these clearly are not um, uh, activities specific to MS. These are popular exercise programs throughout. Uh, but one commonality that we can see is uh, there it does tend to be this aspect of functionality uh, that people are trying to accomplish. Um, so there's some specificity in, in which the exercises um, have been arranged. Uh, even if we go back to the 1950s, uh, looking at trying to develop some different activities that you can do at home uh, that may translate into some functional types of activities. And when we look at things like CrossFit and, and TRX and, and some of these other uh, more popular programs, they carry through with a lot of the very similar um, uh, principles uh, of exercise, uh, but some of them have just taken it to a, a, a different level uh, in terms of the intensities, uh, and, uh, but utilizing uh, different, even in some cases, household types of uh, items. So if you think of CrossFit, they have um, uh, very uh, functional types of um, equipment that they use as opposed to the traditional um, uh, weight machines and, and the like. So looking at ways in which you can use what you have available. All right, the next slide uh, just indicates that um, uh, what I was just alluding to is specificity of training and functional exercise training uh, have been core components of uh, uh, exercise programs for a long period of time. And if we move into the next slide, uh, we look at really what is defined as specificity of training. Uh, specificity of training is also referred to as specific adaptations to impose demands. Um, so if you break that down, it's, it's how your body adapts to the way in which you are training it. Um, uh, the, the second bullet just gives a more um, kind of scientific definition, uh, which really talks about how uh, you have different physiologic changes uh, that are specific to the muscular, cardiorespiratory, and neurologic responses uh, that are required to do that particular activity. Um, but in, in, um, in a nutshell, what we're really talking about is that uh, the way you train will in large part determine the ultimate outcome of your training. Um, so if you train in a specific way and you train specific muscles, those are the ones that are going to improve and you're going to improve in that particular way, the way that you are participating in your exercise program. So we want to try to simulate uh, based on the goals that we have developed for our exercise program, the activities that we want to do in order to improve in those areas. The next slide moves on to functional exercise training uh, and the definitions of those. Uh, according to the Mayo Clinic, functional exercise train your muscles to help you do ev everyday activities safely and efficiently. So you can see there's a very close correlation between what we just talked about with specificity of training uh, and functional exercise training. Uh, we want to do things in a specific way or we want to train in a specific way or we want to exercise in a specific way and we want to make those functional. Uh, so if we do things the way that we do them in life, um, we're going to improve in those particular areas. Uh, whereas if we do very isolated types of exercises, we will improve uh, in those particular um, arenas, but it may not 
translate over to what it is that we want it to accomplish. Um, so th those are general statements, um, and we may need a, a certain level uh, of foundation of strength in order to be able to move on to some of these functional activities. But in, in part, what we really want to do is focus on training that allows us to move through um, various patterns that are more functional. Usually it's in multiple planes, um, so we don't do things in just uh, in, in a very linear fashion. We reach across our body, which goes through uh, various planes. We have to get up on our toes in some cases and reach. Uh, we have to do um, different activities um, that require us to go through various planes of movement. And we want to train ourselves uh, the best we can from a balance, a stabilization, and a strengthening standpoint uh, to best simulate that. And we're going to talk about some very specific examples uh, as we move forward here. Uh, the next uh, slide talks about the, the fact that we combine specificity and functional training. Uh, and I already mentioned that there's a, a strong correlation even in their definitions. Uh, but Combining specificity and, and functionality uh, is something that we often do as part of rehab programs. So if you go back to that initial slide about how rehabilitation often uh, is, has a focal component of exercise or physical activity, um, this is really where it comes from. Uh, the exercise programs uh, that we tend to design as physical occupational uh, therapists and even exercise specialists who uh, work in the area of rehabilitation, um, design programs to achieve functional outcomes. Um, some of that is driven by um, reimbursement because we need to main sh make sure that we're moving towards uh, improved functionality. Uh, but uh, but a lot of it is really because that's what our goal is, is to improve, and in some cases, it's to maintain function. Um, but we really want to emphasize real-life types of activities. Um, so that's why we try to train the best way we can in order to accomplish those goals. Uh, so that really gets to an, an important um, uh, component, is that we want to try to maintain uh, proper movement patterns. And so proper instruction uh, and breaking down different types of movements and making recommendations around exercise uh, is a really important uh, uh, component of neurological rehabilitation programs. Uh, we know that uh, secondary to MS, we might have uh, weakness or uh, spasticity, uh, stiffness that goes along with that, that change our movement patterns. Um, so I'm sure there's people out there saying, well, that's great. I'd love to be able to do this, if, but uh, part of my challenge is that my movement pattern is, is, um, is not uh, necessarily like it used to be. So, and that's due to my uh, lack of strength or flexibility. So we do need to break things down uh, and perhaps isolate and then move on to some of those functional movement patterns. Uh, but what we also note uh, in, in a rehabilitation setting is that sometimes uh, over a period of time, we make changes due to those uh, lack of uh, strength or uh, flexibility or balance, uh, and, and therefore we form some habitual movement patterns. So we will throw our leg out to the side because we have weakness in our hip flexors. So we may need to try to come back to maximizing proper movement patterns uh, in order to best gain the results that we want to. Okay, so the next slide. Uh, that we move into uh, presents this, this idea of neuroplasticity. And uh, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time uh, on this other than uh, to bring up the concept that neuroplasticity does exist uh, and that we can uh, a lot make adapt, uh, adaptive changes. Uh, we often think about uh, fixed types of um, changes that have occurred. Uh, and we know that the brain adapts very well. Uh, and we can often find different routes in which uh, the nerve transmission can travel in order to uh, allow us to um, accomplish various movement patterns. Uh, so that's the whole idea behind neuroplasticity is trying to get, it, get in early with our exercise programs, uh, form these uh, patterns 
to uh, avoid uh, bad habits, if you will, or to avoid um, the or, or allow our, our brain and uh, to adapt and make those changes so we can uh, then maintain our movement patterns the best we can. So neuroplasticity does exist, and, and we know that uh, more and more it is something that can be very helpful. It is something that the next slide uh, talks about. It is something that we often take advantage of uh, as part of physical therapy, and we also know that physical therapy uh, does have a beneficial effect uh, on areas of neuroplasticity. Um, if you have a slide in front of you, the first bullet will tell you that it, uh, there has been research that has indicated uh, uh, physical therapy does result in enhanced synaptic transmission, uh, the ability for the nerve to conduct, uh, as well as some remodeling and, and axonal sprouting uh, that, that go along with uh, those types of movements. And that's, again, focusing in on those uh, movement patterns and, and allowing us to take it best advantage of. Repetition is a huge component of that, uh, and we want to make sure that the repetition that we are doing uh, is is of the proper movement pattern. So uh, we're not creating um, abnormal movement patterns with our, uh, our our interventions. Exercise and cognitive training can also prom uh, promote neuroplasticity, and, and these aren't specifically uh, together, um, although there is some evidence that um, exercise and, and cognition uh, together do have some benefits. Uh, it's talking about exercise uh, can promote neuroplasticity, and cognitive um, training can also promote neuroplasticity. So these are, uh, uh, again, components of a, a, a comprehensive rehab program. Uh, so those are uh, things that we want to definitely take advantage of. And, and uh, in MS, we, we often see this uh, early on in which we can um, take advantage uh, after someone perhaps has had a, a relapse and, and some of those uh, movement patterns have been altered. Uh, we want to utilize rehabilitation approaches in order to best normalize uh, everything that we can uh, and take advantage of that plastic uh, aspect of the, the nervous system. The next slide just talks about principles of uh, exercise-dependent plasticity. Uh, I'm not going to go through each one of these, but, but essentially what it's talking about, and I, I brought up the repetition uh, component of it, um, repetition does matter. Uh, and in order to uh, take advantage and, and uh, induce plasticity, we do need to do things uh, in a repetition, repetition fashion. Uh, so we want to make sure that things are done over and over and, again, done in the way that we want to be able to train the system to do that. Um, you'll see the word specificity on there. Uh, that also is uh, an important component in order to uh, best uh, train the system the way that we want to uh, in order to be able to um, uh, take advantage of it. Uh, we want to have the training be specific. We want to do that repetition, uh, and we want to make sure that uh, it has a, an appropriate intensity involved uh, in order to induce that plasticity also. Uh, there's other things that, that are uh, important in this, and, and particularly uh, as it relates to, um, uh, to MS, time matters. Uh, so we want to make sure that we try to um, take advantage of uh, plasticity uh, at times in which we can, um, when we know that we have some of those uh, alternative uh, pathways uh, that we can take advantage of. Uh, age matters, uh, and, and this just indicates that uh, training-induced plasticity occurs more readily in younger brains. Um, uh, and uh, so that's certainly something that uh, we need to think about as uh, uh, as we age. We all lose um, our, our some some of our brain volumes, so we want to make sure that we uh, are able to try to take the best advantage of we can. That doesn't mean that we can't um, take advantage of these things uh, later on, but uh, we do know that it it does occur more readily uh, in younger uh, brains. Okay. Uh, so the next slide is, is just a graphic that uh, talks about the different aspects. Uh, I suspect MS Focus um, has had uh, some some past teleconferences or, or educational programs talking about uh, what we know from the standpoint of uh, immune modulating effects, uh, and, and most of those have 
to do with anti-inflammatory properties uh, with exercise. Um, so we know that we can get uh, some um, reduction in inflammatory uh, chemicals or, or cytokines that can uh, go along with an exercise program. Uh, that would be uh, the um, kind of the orange or, or uh, you know, the orange uh, dotted line, or maybe it's more yellow, uh, that shows uh, a course of experimental MS. So this is a mouse model of MS uh, in which you see that top orange line, uh, which shows essentially what we would see in a natural disease course. Uh, we add in the exercise uh, components that, that have an effect on the immune system, and you can see that that disease peak um, comes down uh, and the recovery comes closer to baseline. Uh, the green dotted line indicates some of that plasticity component. So the ability for us to take advantage uh, of this particular, um, and in this case what we're talking about is a, is a relapse uh, of an experimental model of multiple sclerosis. Uh, so we can reduce that uh, function uh, or we can, we can improve the function and we can reduce the functional loss uh, with an exercise program both from the, uh, the central components uh, or the immune components uh, of uh, changing inflammatory cytokines and uh, reducing uh, perhaps some of the uh, activity of the T cells. Uh, and then we also see some of these changes uh, from a neuroplasticity standpoint, uh, which are indicated by that green line. Okay, the next slide uh, just uh, covers another concept uh, that, that I think is important because it's getting more and more, uh, we're getting more and more information on it. Uh, it's constraint-induced therapy. This may be something that you've uh, heard of uh, from stroke rehab. Uh, this has been studied extensively uh, in individuals who are recovering from stroke. Uh, but really the idea is to uh, overcome what is known as learn non-use, okay? I'm, I referred to it as um, uh, forming some habits, uh, but in this case, uh, there's this learned non-use. So if, uh, if in the case of a stroke, uh, someone typically has one side affected, uh, and what they will often do in order to be able to maintain their functional and, uh, independence is they will tend to use their good side. Uh, at the extent or to the extent that they don't use their, their affected side at all. Uh, and then they have this behavioral suppression uh, of any kind of purposeful movement. Um, so it's that if you don't use it, you lose it idea um, that uh, can go into that. Now this can also occur uh, in MS, uh, and we see that some people who have more weakness on one side or, or have more functional decline uh, on, on one side will tend to use uh, another side, uh, and therefore they will get some of that non or that learned non-use. Uh, so some studies have been looking at uh, individuals with MS uh, and utilizing constraint-induced therapy uh, for both upper extremities and lower extremities. Uh, so. Uh, the typical uh, upper extremity is, uh, and, and there's a picture of it, and I'm going to move to that slide here, uh, which shows this, this gentleman who is um, uh, in, a, in a situation where he has a glove on his right hand here, uh, and his affected side is his left side, and essentially he's being forced um, to use that left side in order to be able to pick up the food and, um, and, and feed himself. Um, that's what a constraint-induced therapy program is, is to really eliminate that quote-unquote good side uh, and use the side that has more um, uh, functional loss uh, in order to relearn uh, that movement. Um, so some of the studies have shown that there is improvement in people with MS, just like there has been in stroke. Uh, you may ask, how did they do this with lower extremities, since I alluded to that earlier? Uh, essentially, they don't um, put a, a, a mitt or anything like that on the, on the good side, but they will provide uh, verbal feedback primarily uh, when the, uh, the affected side is doing the movement properly. Um, so there's that uh, 
feeling uh, of how you're doing the movement, and then there's the verbal feedback, and there may even be some visual feedback um, that goes along with that. So that's how they measure that, uh, or that's how they uh, uh, conduct constraint-induced therapy for the lower extremities. Um, the upper extremities usually is um, by eliminating the ability to even uh, grip that fork in this picture with that right hand because that glove is on. Okay, so there's more and more coming out about this uh, and uh, you can keep your eyes out uh, for it. You could ask one of your rehab professionals if this is something that um, you think might be beneficial for you, but it certainly is something that needs to be uh, um, kind of incorporated and, and evaluated in order to be able to uh, uh, best put into your, your exercise program. I wouldn't just go out and, um, and, and try to do it, uh, but I would, I would definitely get an evaluation to make sure that that's something that would work. This is much more of a rehabilitative approach. So if we go, move on to the next slide, how do you really decide what is best for you? Um, and that really does get into, I think, in many cases, trying to consult with a physical or occupational therapist. Uh, and the reason for that is that they can help you analyze the activity. Uh, they can break it down into its component parts. Uh, and from that analysis, um, that is, should be a, a give and take and, and a discussion based on what your goals are, they can then identify what exercises would be best to benefit you. Uh, and that may mean that they need, there needs to be a building up of uh, some foundational strength or range of motion or flexibility. Um, so you may not just be moving right into uh, some of those various functional activities. You might need to uh, get a, a certain baseline of strength uh, in order to be able to accomplish that or range of motion. So you may be doing some very uh, specific uh, uh, strength training or, or flexibility training, for example. Uh, and then a part of that is also determining if there are adaptations that might be appropriate. Um, so if we think about uh, ambulation in which we have uh, uh, weakness on one side, uh, adding in an assisted device may actually normalize that gait a little bit more. Um, so you're actually training uh, in a way that allows your, um, your gait to improve, uh, which may or, or may not uh, allow you to have um, the, the assistive device in certain situations and, and maybe not in others. Uh, but uh, there are definitely ways in which you can uh, train yourself uh, in order to be able to, again, get that repetition, form that uh, appropriate functional habit. Um, the next one I indicate is take a video of the activity. Um, so if you uh, perhaps, and this can be very helpful because you may uh, have some differences uh, from morning to afternoon or you may have some differences depending upon uh, time of year, uh, ambient temperature, those kinds of things. So taking a video of the activity um, is an important component to show uh, this is where I'm having my challenges uh, because when you're in visiting the physical therapist, it may not be the same. Uh, it might be a, a different environment that you're having problems. Maybe you're uh, having more difficulty outside on a grassy surface versus um, in a uh, clinical setting where uh, you're walking on carpet or, or uh, some other type of uh, level surface. So taking a video of the activity can help the therapist um, break down the movements and, and better understand what it is that you're um, trying to accomplish. Uh, and then we look at closed chain versus open chain activities. Um, and we'll show you some examples of that. But essentially, closed chain activities look at having a fixed body segment um, versus uh, open chain activities with free body segments. Um, so the best thing to, to think about, uh, in, in, I'll show you some pictures of that, but for those who don't have access to that, uh, think about uh, doing a, um, an extension of your elbow with a weight, uh, and that could be on a, uh, uh, in the gym on a machine, uh, or it might be using a resistance band, uh, but you're getting some resistance on straightening of your elbow. Uh, that would be an open chain activity. Uh, if you went down and did a push-up, 
Um, now all of a sudden you fix that body segment uh, on the floor and you go from that uh, being on the floor to pushing yourself up. You're essentially doing the same movement at the elbow. You're extending it. Uh, however, because you have that fixed body segment, you add in some other components of stability and, um, uh, and so on and so forth. So we'll, we'll go through that a little bit more uh, in detail. Uh, in addition, we often see um, that the closed chain activities can incorporate uh, multiple joints and muscles, uh, and, and many open chain activities tend to isolate uh, the joints and the muscles. That's not, that's not a, um, 100% uh, in either case, but, but a lot of times uh, we can incorporate a lot more um, of multiple joint uh, movements uh, with closed chain activities uh, and um, the free body segment um, often indicates that we're isolating uh, specific joints. Again, not 100%, and there are certainly some open chain activities that, uh, that move multiple joints and, and through multiple planes. Okay? Uh, so the next, um, the next slide shows some of those different ideas. So uh, the one I just described on the top is um, uh, a triceps extension machine uh, in which you sit on it and then you push the weight forward. Uh, usually with both hands. Um, there's a number of different types and different handles, but that's essentially the movement. You can see he's extending at his elbows there um, from the first one to the second one. Uh, whereas if you go all the way to the, uh, the upper right, you see this gentleman doing a push-up uh, with uh, presumably his son on his back. Um, so that is uh, moving from a, a, a down position in a push-up to an up. Uh, again, is extending the elbows, but uh, with the body weight, he's getting a lot of stabilization in his shoulder girdle um, and um, also getting some movement uh, at his shoulders to accomplish uh, some additional strengthening there. Uh, the middle uh, is an interesting one because this gentleman is sitting on a therapy ball, uh, so he's getting some core stabilization. Um, his feet are fixed on the floor. He's getting actually a little bit of movement um, down in his lower extremities, which would probably be considered closed chain. Uh, but doing the triceps extension with, his, um, uh, with the weight uh, would be more of an open chain. So he's kind of combined uh, some different things here, uh, and, and that's a great way to, to approach things also. For the lower extremity, if we go down to the bottom of this slide, you'll see uh, a typical knee extension machine, which has the role in which uh, someone pushes out uh, against the weight uh, and then lowers it slowly. Uh, you can do that with one leg or two legs. This person is doing it with one. Uh, versus where the feet are fixed on the floor uh, and you go from a, a, a a sitting position uh, or a squatted position uh, up to a standing position. Uh, so you're doing these little squats, uh, which are uh, not isolating your quadriceps like they are in the um, picture that is the open chain uh, pushing out on that machine, but actually you're getting multiple movements, multiple joints, and multiple um, muscles involved in that movement. The quadriceps um, are one of them. Okay, so that just gives you some examples of some lower extremity as well as upper extremity closed chain versus uh, open chain. All right, so now we're going to move into some more of the, uh, the actual activities. So if we break down the movement and we move to the first, uh, which is slide 19, um, we see this individual uh, getting up from bed. Okay, so from a lying position to a sitting position on the end of the on the edge of the bed, uh, this may be a, a mobility issue, and it may be uh, due to the fact that there's not enough strength. It may be a balance issue that uh, do just fine until you get to that sitting position, and then you start to lose some of that balance. Uh, it may be a flexibility issue, the ability to get those uh, legs up. Uh, and, and turn them over the side of the bed and, and get yourself to a sitting position. So if we break down that movement, we look at uh, one thing that we need is that ability to move our hips to the side uh, in order to get up properly uh, in a log roll type fashion. So the legs roll to the side, uh, we have to have a certain amount of flexibility. So the exercise below, which is um, uh, listed as lumbar rotation, will start to help with that process. So doing this particular activity uh, may be the first step uh, in order to be able to improve getting from that lying to that sitting position. 
Uh, in addition, if we look kind of at that middle section um, of him getting up from his bed, he requires a certain amount of um, strength in his triceps uh, and in his shoulders to be able to push up, uh, push his upper body up. Uh, so if you look at that sequence getting out of bed, it's kind of that middle image of him, uh, which is about halfway up. He's having to push from one of his arms. So making sure that those triceps are strong enough uh, may be an appropriate component. Uh, that may be where things are breaking down. Uh, might need a little bit more uh, assistance with that strength. And then lastly, when he's sitting up, um, he may again have that problem with the balance, so we can work on some sitting balance activities. Uh, so looking at ways in which uh, you can go side to side and making sure that uh, you challenge your balance a little bit in order to be able to always recover to that midline position. Um, so those are just some examples of, of ways in which we might break down the movement uh, and depending upon which component uh, one is having difficulty with, we might focus in on one area more than the other, um, the flexibility, the strength, and the balance. Uh, and, and clearly, it's, it's not that uh, simplistic, but it gives you an idea on how we might break it down uh, in order to be able to better improve that functional movement. The next slide. Um, uh, normally, these come up one at a time, and, and the one on the left where the gentleman is standing and putting on his sock is, is the first one that you see. Um, so the first thing I typically say from there is, what you may need to do is make an adaptation. You might need to sit down, um, like the gentleman on the right, uh, where he's sitting on the bed and, and putting on his socks. Uh, so that's one way in which you might be able to, if balance is a problem and you're nor normally putting on your, your socks uh, in a standing position and that's become uh, problematic uh, or challenging, this is a good way in which you can just make an adaptation for safety and, and energy sake uh, is sit down to put your socks on. Um, however, you'll see that the, in both situations, you need to have a certain amount of flexibility. That leg needs to be able to come up uh, in order for you to be able to get um, the sock on. So the m middle picture shows uh, a stretching exercise um, where uh, this uh, woman is laying on her back and, and stretching out uh, those muscles in uh, her buttocks and, and low back uh, that allow her to do that movement. Um, so that may be uh, something that we would incorporate. Um, if... Uh, you know, the training is that uh, you want to be able to, to put on your socks standing up. Again, I would uh, recommend that if it's, it's not safe that you don't do that. But there are standing balance activities, just like the one on the lower left, uh, in which this gentleman is just practicing uh, that standing on one foot. Uh, and uh, that would translate to what it is that you need to do. Now, obviously, you would need to uh, add in movements from there uh, because it's not just standing on one foot. He still needs to get that other foot up to, to put the sock on. So, but that's how you break down these particular movements. Um, the gentleman on the right who's sitting still has to have a certain level of balance um, in order to lift that foot up and not lose his balance backwards or, or forwards or to the side. Um, the, uh, the picture directly below that shows a, a woman on a therapy ball uh, and doing some, some different activities uh, that challenge her sitting balance. Uh, and that is certainly something that, that could be added if, uh, if that's a component that is where the breakdown is occurring, if you will, uh, in which that person needs to be able to uh, better uh, balance themselves in the sitting position. And then lastly, uh, it's, it's also important to note that there are some adaptive aids. Uh, the one in the middle bottom is a sock aid uh, in which uh, you're able to essentially load the sock on there and then slide your foot down in uh, to that particular device uh, and then pull it up and that will pull the sock up for you. So um, in many cases, that's uh, again, you need to weigh the options of, of balance energy uh, with your activities of daily living and, and how you want to spend your energy throughout the day. Uh, and this may be one way to save some of that in order for you to be able to do other things. 
All right, if we move to the next slide, we, we look at uh, a couple of different components here um, uh, that are more ambulatory in nature. Uh, the one on the left shows a gentleman climbing the steps. Um, the uh, second one shows uh, essentially the, the gait cycle. Uh, I have the red arrow to identify uh, essentially uh, a, a weak link that we often see in the gait cycle is, is that individual's ability to bear weight on one leg without the knee snapping back uh, or in some cases buckling. Um, so we can, we can evaluate that and look and see uh, if that's a... Uh, a, a challenge as part of the gait cycle for people. Uh, sometimes it occurs in the next one, but, uh, but often we see that that knee will either back out or, or kind of buckle in that position. So we want to work on how we can strengthen uh, those particular muscles. Uh, and the ones uh, that we see below are uh, some ways in which we can really try to get back to specific aspects of strengthening those muscles uh, and working on balance uh, through that particular range of motion. So uh, often it's, um, it's the ability to control that knee um, from either snapping back or buckling in that particular range of motion. So if we can isolate that and become very specific to how we strengthen those um, muscles, uh, we can get some crossover uh, and someone can uh, improve uh, that, uh, that portion of their gait cycle uh, with some of that kind of uh, intervention and some of those kinds of exercises. Uh, the step up that you see on the left um, down below, uh, you can see almost exactly simulates that stair climbing. Uh, if we have that person come up uh, and bring their left foot in this case up onto the top of that step, uh, we can work with different size steps in order to um, identify and, and best uh, isolate the range of motion that we want. Uh, likewise, if we look at the, uh, the squat that is being done on the right, uh, we can isolate uh, and, and, again, go through a very specific range of motion. It doesn't have to be a full squat, and in most cases isn't for this purpose. Uh, it's just working on those last few degrees of extension. All right, the next slide um, shows uh, uh, an individual lifting a laundry basket. Uh, so you can see uh, there's a number of different components. It's a much more complex movement um, uh, than we often think. So when we break it down, you can see that she's having to bend down, pick it up. Uh, so the arms are extended uh, at first, and if you go to the last um, portion, you'll see that her arms are bent because she's brought the basket close to her body. Um, in addition, the, the knees are bent um, uh, in the first um, sequence, and they are straight when she has the basket pulled up and, and close to her body. So we need to work on a couple of different things there. Uh, the first one shows, again, that, that squat uh, from the chair or even going from a sitting to standing position uh, in which we try to simulate that portion of the knee. Um, uh, that is going from a bent to a straight position. In addition, we have the, uh, the arm component. Uh, now, I don't know how heavy that, that laundry basket is, and you know probably better how heavy yours is, but you do have to have a certain amount of upper extremity strength uh, in order to be able to lift that. Um, so these bent over rows, for example, with a resistive band will help um, particularly in a standing position, simulate that movement. So breaking down the movement again into its component parts uh, in order to be able to improve uh, that overall functional activity. All right, and then we move to the next slide, and, and I think that may be, this may be my last one that we're breaking down. Uh, if you look at the top slide, it basically just shows a, uh, a light in the distance. Um, uh, this, uh, in, in kind of tongue-in-cheek, is to, um, to simulate perhaps what it looks like when you get up at night, and that's the bathroom. Um, you have to get there in the dark. Uh, well, first of all, I would say that making adaptations uh, around lighting is, is a good idea, um, whether it be night lights or, or otherwise. Uh, if that's not possible and, and you need, uh, and, and there's a challenge with that uh, walking in the dark, you know, may need to have something a little bit closer, a bedside commode of some sort. Uh, but there are ways in which we can work on training uh, balance uh, by uh, utilizing the different systems um, that go along with our balance. Uh, and the, the exercises you see below really are um, some 
some activities that allow us to start to get used to how our body moves. Um, we can add in the components uh, with the appropriate um, uh, support around us, like you see he has a chair down below him. Uh, and then uh, if uh, we can add in closing our eyes, um, which then will simulate and, and allow us to, or force us, if you will, to use systems other than our vision, um, which is what happens when the light is low um, or, or non-existent. So we can train our systems a little bit better uh, and, uh, and, and hopefully um, allow, us, allow ourselves to be, be safer in those particular environments. Um, the one to the right there shows uh, varying surfaces. Uh, this person is up against the um, kind of a corner, uh, so they're protected um, should they start to lose their balance backwards. Um, they also have the chair, so they've, they've got themselves well supported, but they've changed their surface that they're standing on. So um, if they uh, can train themselves that way, uh, they can also add in other components um, like changing the visual system, changing um, uh, some different aspects to better, to, mo to more challenge their balance. Um, once again, I, I, I reiterate that um, it's best if you can have um, all of your systems in place uh, from a safety perspective. Um, so if you have lights that allow you to, um, that maybe come on automatically or, or the like, uh, that would be helpful. Um, in, in, from a safety perspective, as well as from a balance perspective. So if I move to the next uh, slide, it just talks about some exercise examples. Um, we break it down into a number of different areas, uh, aerobic or endurance, uh, in many cases like with gait. Um, that is something that we see can be, be challenging. So we need to have a baseline of, of endurance, and it's certainly important to incorporate, uh, just from an overall fitness standpoint, uh, aerobic or endurance program. Uh, components into your program. Strengthening, we've gone through a couple of them. If we can identify multiple joints and multiple plane movements, uh, they often tend to be more functional. Uh, and, and using your physical therapist and your occupational therapist to help you define those movements based on where your needs are uh, is, is, a, um, is recommended. Uh, stretching, uh, often the forgotten exercise uh, class, we need to make sure that we uh, incorporate stretching as part of our program, uh, and then balance activities. Uh, again, I, I highly recommend uh, consulting with a physical or occupational therapy to um, make sure that it's specific to your needs. Uh, there's some of these com combination activities, yoga, Pilates, aquatic exercise, which, which can combine uh, a lot of different aspects of, of strength, flexibility, and, and even some of these closed chain activities we talked about uh, can do that. Um, so again, these are, are ways in which you can combine modes of activity, uh, so uh, you can often get more bang for your buck. Um, but make sure that they're modified uh, so you're safe from a balance perspective uh, and um, you're not overheated and, and all of those kinds of things. You can also look at ad adapting activities, which is the next slide. Uh, the, the upper left shows kind of a, a modified volleyball with using a balloon, um, which can challenge balance, uh, uh, coordination, some flexibility, those kinds of things. Um, even some fun recreational types of activities, which certainly fall under the realm of physical activity, like bowling down below. Uh, you know, this is a way in which someone can still participate in those activities, um, but aren't challenging their balance quite as much. Um, there's adaptive equipment um, that allow us uh, wheelchair uh, accessibility uh, into the machines and allow you to participate uh, uh, as fully in those exercise programs uh, as anyone else. Uh, the next slide shows you an, a recumbent tricycle, uh, which uh, again can be very helpful in allowing people to get out and about, uh, but if balance uh, on a regular bike is a challenge, this um, may be an option, uh, and there's a number of different models out there. Uh, and then down below, we have a, a semi-recumbent elliptical uh, pictured, uh, which allows both arm and leg movement. Uh, so that can be very helpful uh, if someone has uh, fatigue in either their lower or their upper bodies, uh, and it also allows um, the ability um, from a balance perspective that you're not doing a stand-up elliptical, um, so you're still getting a good aerobic type of workout. Uh, you can spread out the workload between the arms and the legs, um, but you don't have to worry about balance. 
So how do the next slide just says how do you start my start or change my exercise program? Um, essentially, you're going to be in one of these. Uh, the next slide indicates uh, identifying your state of change. Um, are you ready for this? Um, is, is this something that you want to do? Just kind of identifying where you are in the process of making that behavior change. And this, by the way, is not specific to exercise, but exercise is a behavior change. So looking at where you are in that, that um, line and, and how you might be able to seek out uh, assistance um, to allow you with the planning portion or making the behavior change, uh, or even gathering the information for considering the change. The next slide uh, just uh, is another way in which you can look at it and say, you know, where am I? How, how am I ready to make this change? Am I willing to make it? Uh, and how confident am I that I can make this change? Uh, once again, this may guide you in, in terms of uh, what the next steps are. Do I need to seek out that assistance from a therapist? Do I need to go online and check out uh, various videos? Um, because I'm definitely ready and I think I can do it. Um, but making sure that you have all of the, the pieces in place um, so you're going to be successful. Uh, the next one is just some uh, ideas to think about. Uh, group versus individual exercise. Research definitely shows us that, that people tend to uh, be more compliant or, or more um, uh, they, they tend to work better in group exercise. There's an accountability factor there. Uh, but you need to know what works for you. Some people like to exercise on their own um, and don't like the idea of group activities. But know what works for you and know that sometimes working, uh, working in a group and participating as part of a group uh, can be very helpful um, when you're allowed to get back out into um, larger groups. Uh, goal setting, knowing where you are um, and, and where you want to go. Uh, we talked a lot about functional types of activities, uh, and ultimately that's what we want to look towards improving is your function. Uh, finding activities in which you can participate uh, and, and knowing your body around fatigue and heat sensitivity. Uh, that will help you plan time of day. Uh, and then use different strategies to monitor your progress. Um, you, know, you can use Fitbits and Apple Watches and all of those things, but you can also use an exercise log uh, if you don't have access to those. So find ways in which you can monitor your progress. Um, I'm going to kind of skip over uh, most of the next slide, which is exercise prescription. I do want to point out uh, a couple of things regarding intensity. Uh, the two-hour rule is uh, merely if you don't feel as good two hours after you've completed your exercise, you've probably done too much. Um, so if you maybe did a little bit too much intensity, maybe you went a little too far, uh, a little too long, um, that's how we identify. So it's, a, it's, it's looking back. It's not something that is uh, prospective, if you will, but it is something that you can help for the next time you go out and say, well, I just did too much or I did it too hard. Uh, and then the 10-minute rule can be adapted for whatever your program is uh, in which you start your exercise program, go through a little bit of the activity. If you don't feel as good, uh, if you feel worse than when you started, go ahead and stop. There are certain days that it just doesn't work and that MS fatigue um, may not allow you to move forward. Uh, but there are many days in which it's just getting, overcoming the inertia uh, and trying to make sure that we uh, are able to kind of get over that mental fatigue and then uh, we feel pretty good. So if we do that for a few minutes and um, we actually feel a little bit better, uh, or we don't feel any worse, then I would say continue with your exercise program. Um, if you feel worse, then I would go ahead and, and stop. All right. And then on to the last slide that I have um, is just a, a, a graph that shows you um, ways in which you can make decisions about behavior change. Um, almost everything that we make a decision about is low risk uh, or has a risk and a reward ratio. Um, you can see that low risk and high reward and then low risk, low reward, high risk, high reward, high risk, low reward. So there are many activities that we think about that could be um, very high risk. Um, you know, we think about skydiving and we think about those kinds of things. There can be uh, a high risk, high reward to that. It can be very exhilarating um, uh, an activity. Um, there are also relatively low risk, uh, low reward activities. Um, 
But what we know is that exercise is a relatively low risk activity. It doesn't cost a lot. You can do things pretty much in your home. Um, and, uh, and there's uh, any kind of fatigue or, or challenges that you face with MS typically are uh, transient. So if you, uh, you will recover, um, and there can be a very high reward. We talked about the neuroplasticity. We talked about some of the immune modulating. That could be a very high reward. Um, uh, but it's definitely a low-risk activity uh, and, and certainly something that uh, if you are uh, inclined uh, to move forward with, and, um, uh, and I wish you the best of luck in doing so.